this is lecture 5 today we discuss some mathematical preliminary results that you have already studied in uh, signals and networks <coughs> and in basic mathematics course so these uh, mathematical preliminaries uh, are essential to better understand uh, control analysis today we discuss about the function of a complex variable, then analytic function, pole and zero of a function. So I'll be giving you all the formal definitions of uh, these functions. So let us start. What is that uh, function of a complex variable? That is function of a complex variable. So let S be a complex variable, be a complex variable. A function of the complex variable of the complex variable GS defined as GS is represented by its real and imaginary parts. So that is whenever you have a function that is GS, S is that complex variable then we can represent it that is actually that real part of gs and the imaginary part of gs you all know those things so now if we talk about that mapping through that complex function then how it looks like so suppose this is your complex plane that is sigma j omega. So that is actually that S plane. And we have another plane that is that real of G S. And here you have that imaginary of G S. So now if you take any point here, Suppose this is a point in S plane. And if you would like to map through GS, that is mapping through GS, so what will you get? So suppose there is another point that is GS, and this one is mapped from S plane to GS plane. So now the two definitions would come here. One is which is called single valued function and which is called one to one mapping. If for every value of S there is only one corresponding value of GS, it is called single valued function. That is if for every value of S, there is only one corresponding value, one corresponding value of GS,
then it is called single valued function now if we take if we consider the reverse mapping that means whenever you take a point here then if we would like to go back to this S plane and if the mapping from GH to S plane is also single valued then it is called one to one mapping. What is that? If the mapping I think you all know those things you have learned it in complex variables and in basic mathematics course if the mapping from GS to S plane is also single valued, it is called one to one mapping. So in control analysis, we'll be considering this type of mapping, one-to-one -one mapping, and later on you will see that whenever we'll do some analysis, stability analysis, we'll be considering all single valued function. So I hope at that time, you should not be confused about that definitions because from here you can understand what is single valued function and what is one to one mapping. So let us see one example. Let us see one example. Say you have a function that is GS equal to 1 by s plus s plus 1. So here s is that complex variable and s to gs plane. So in this case s to gs plane single valued mapping because if you take any point in this S plane and then any point in S plane, then you can see that you see that mapping would be that single value mapping because if you put any value here, S value here, any value here S, then you will get a single value of GS. So it is a single valued mapping, but the reverse one, the reverse one means if you take a value here GS, you need to find what is the corresponding value of S so that you will get this GS. That means the reverse mapping is not single valued, but the reverse mapping is not single valued. Why? We have considered here this S plane and GS plane, so including that infinity. So these planes are with infinity points. So then here you can see whenever g is equal to infinity, then we have two values of s, 
two values of s. So that means when g s equal to infinity, we can have two values of s. One is if you put s equal to zero, if you put s equal to zero, then also you will get infinity as well as if you put s equal to minus one, you will get g s equal to infinity. That means this infinite point here, the infinite point here in GS plane. So it is mapped in two points. One is that zero point and another one is coming at minus one point. So you can see here as infinity is mapped in two points, zero and minus one. So it is not a single valued function. So is mapped onto s equal to 0 and s equal to minus 1. So from this example, you can understand what is called single valued function and what is one to one mapping. So it is not one to one mapping because from s plane to gs plane, it is single valued mapping. But in the reverse case, that means mapping from gh to s is not a single valued function. So now we will discuss what is analytic function. So this is very important term analytic function. I hope you all know it in complex variables. You have studied it in your basic mathematics course. The analytic function that is a function of complex variable is said to be analytic in a region of S plane of the function. And that means uh, if the function and its all derivatives exist in that region. So a function of complex variable GS is said to be analytic in a region of S plane if the function and all its derivatives exist in the region. So let us uh, just write the definition of function. A function of complex variable GS is said to be analytic is said to be analytic in a region of S plane. So S plane that is that complex plane. If the function and all its derivatives, all its derivatives exist in the region. So that means if you take uh, consider a region in complex plane and if you can show that a function exists that means it does not take any infinite value. So it exists and all of its derivatives also exist in that region. That means you can say the function is analytic in that region. So let us see uh, one example. Uh, suppose uh, GS is a function that is this is that complex variable so here we can see this function would be infinite if you put s equal to 0 so that means if you put s equal to 0 or if you put s equal to minus 2 so at those two points this function would be infinite that means those are not defined so we can say that this function is analytic this function is analytic 
the function is analytic except s equal to 0 and s equal to minus 2. Similarly, so this function I have taken a rational function. Similarly, if you take another function, say suppose g s equal to s plus 1. So, it is very easy to understand that if you put any values of s here except in finite, so that means if you consider that finite s plane, this function is analytic. So that means it is analytic and you can also check if you take derivative of that function. So all derivatives, derivatives would exist. Analytic in finite, finite S plane. So that means this would be only in finite that if you take S equal to infinity. That means if you consider that finite S plane this function is analytic. So these are the two definitions and all through the course I'll be uh, using this term that function is analytic. I hope later on you should not be confused. So now uh, we'll be discussing an important concept that is pole and zero of a function. So I think all of you have studied poles and zeros of a function in your signals and network course. So here I will be giving you that formal definition that is pole and zero of a function. If a function, so let a function gs be analytic and single valued in the neighborhood of a point p. So that means if you take a point in s plane, P and if you consider uh, the neighborhood of that P uh, and in the neighborhood of that P means excluding that point P if the function is analytic and single valued then it is said to have a pole of order R at S equal to P if limit S tends to P s minus p whole to the power r g s is finite and non-zero. So here first uh, let me just write uh, the definition. So let g s be, uh, be an analytic and single valued function in the neighborhood of point P in the neighborhood of point P. So P is a point. So that means P is a point. That means if you just consider the neighborhood of that P, so excluding that P, excluding that point P, so everywhere, everywhere that function is analytic and uh, single valued function. So it is said to have, it is said to have a pole of order r at s equal to p if this particular limit that means when s tends to p s minus p whole to the power r g s is finite and non-zero. So this is the definition 
this is the definition of a pole that means whenever r equal to say suppose r equal to 1 so that means you have a pole at p so you have a pole at p this is a simple pole that means only one pole is there this is a simple pole similarly if you have r equal to 2 that means at s equal to p you have two poles so that means order 2 so that at the point p you have two poles so let us see one example So that means you have, suppose, GS and this is that function, rational function. So here, if you apply this particular definition, you can see that that simple pole, you have simple pole. at s equal to 0. So basically whenever you have a function like that just by looking at the denominator you can see the value of s for which that gs becomes infinite that means it would be undefined. So those are actually that poles. So whenever you put s equal to 0 here so then that gs would be infinite. So you, you have a simple pole at s equal to 0 and pole of order 2 at s equal to minus 2. That means if you put it here s equal to minus 2, so this gs would be infinite and as the order is 2, so that's why the order 2. So gs so now you can write see that gs is analytic in s plane except at poles so that means a function is analytic in the s plane except the poles locations. That means if you exclude those pole locations in the rest of the region, so this function is analytic. So now we will see the other definition that is called the zeros of a function. So again I am telling you all know those things from your uh, signals and networks. So here just I am giving you all the formal definitions and in control analysis we will be using these terminologies so if you know these definitions later on you would not face any problem so let gs be analytic at s equal to z so this is just actually that inverse of that that means the definition that you have seen in case of pole so if you take that inverse of that so it gives you the definition of zeros so let gs be analytic at s equal to z it is said to have it is said to have a zero of order r zero of order r at s equal to z if the limit similar to that the definition of pole that is that limit s tends to z s minus z here you can see that this is minus r that means just inverse of that gs is finite and 
नॉन जीरो फाइनाइट एंड नॉन जीरो और simply we can say that gs has a zero of order r at s equal to z if 1 by gs just if you take that reciprocal of that function 1 by gs has an rth order pole at s equal to z so that means gs has a zero of order r at s equal to z if 1 by gs has an alt order pole at s equal to z so again this thing would be clear if you see the example so here we are taking one example so suppose gs is that plant that is tain into s plus 2 to s s plus 1 s plus 3 whole square so in this case you can easily see that the function has poles and zeros and the easy way is to see that place the values of insert the values of s for which that gs becomes zero gs becomes zero that gives you the zero and the values of s for which that gs becomes infinite it gives you the poles so in this particular example so if you take s equal to minus 2 so then you can see that if you put s equal to minus 2 here so then you can see g s equal to 0 so that means s equal to minus 2 is a finite zero similarly there are three other zeros at infinite at infinity that means if you just expand it so the order of this one is 4 and now if you divide this numerator and denominator by s to the power 4 then you can see here at s equal to minus 2 it has one zero parallelly there are three other zeros at infinity because if you put s equal to infinity again it would be gs would be equal to 0 and what are the pole locations so one pole is at 0 that is a finite pole another pole is at minus 1 and another two poles are at minus 3 minus 3 so minus 3 is a pole of order 2 and from here you can see that in this type of rational function the number of poles is equal to that number of zeros but if you see so let us first write it then i think it would be very clear that means these poles poles are here zero and minus 1 then minus 3 then minus 3 so these poles are all the finite poles and in case of zeros zeros you can see that one zero is at minus 2 so this is a finite zero and other zeros are at infinite infinite so number of poles and number of zeros are same but the point is the number of zeros here in this case you know you have only one finite zero and other three zeros are infinite so this is 
an important concept which will be required in control analysis. And whenever a uh, rational function is given to you, you can show the location of poles and zeros via pole zero map. So this is pole zero map. So this particular map is used in control systems. So from this map, one can understand where are the locations of poles and zeros for a given rational function. So let us see that pole zero map of this above function. So here the GS that we have taken that is 10 S plus 2 and then S plus 1 and S plus 3 whole square. So in pole zero map we show the locations of poles and zeros and those poles and zeros all are the finite poles and zeros. So we do not show the location of poles or zeros at infinite locations. So only we show the location of poles and zeros in finite location. So we use some terminology, some symbol we use in pole zero map. So pole is indicated by cross and zero is indicated by this symbol, small circle. So in this case, particular in this example, so let us first see what plane it is. So this plane is that sigma j omega, that means this is a complex plane. So now we have a pole here at s equal to say s equal to zero. So that means this is that symbol pole. We have shown that the symbol of that pole is cross. Another pole is at minus one. So another pole is at minus one. And other two poles are at. So it is showing like this. So two poles are there. So this is minus three. And then you can see that there is another zero. So zero is here at minus two. So this is actually that pole zero map. And this particular function is also available in MATLAB. Whenever a function is given to you, a rational function is given to you, then if you draw the pole zero map using these two symbols, that means cross and the small circle, then one can understand where are the locations of poles and zeros of a rational function. So let us see what we have discussed so far. So we have started with that function with complex variable. And then we have seen that mapping, single valued mapping and one to one mapping. And then we have taken some examples. We have discussed what is the definition of analytic function. And then we have given the concept of poles and zeros. Then we have seen how to present that poles and zeros in a plane that is that pole zero map. So now I'll be giving you just some advantages, disadvantages, and what is that basic concept of Laplace transform. So I think you all are familiar with and expert in Laplace transform because you have studied these things in signals and networks, Laplace transform. So this is actually one transform. So before discussing that Laplace transform, here I'm not going to show you the detail of Laplace transform. I think those who forget it, I suggest you to read your class notes of signals and networks. And here just I'll be giving you some formulas and some important transforms, Laplace transforms, which would be required to solve that control problems. 
so laplace transform it is it is a transform so i think let us first understand what is transform and it would be very much clear that means if you see it uh, in case of say logarithm so suppose you have suppose you have two numbers so suppose you have two numbers now if you take that logarithm so if you take that logarithm here you take logarithm here then what you get you will get that logarithm of that function so logarithm of numbers not function logarithms of numbers now whenever it is a product of these two numbers then the logarithm of numbers basically it gives you that addition so this is actually that addition and then here what you get that is that sum of sum of logarithms so now if you take anti logarithms if you take anti logarithms here if you take anti logarithm here so then you will get that product so from this particular example you can understand what we do in case of simple two numbers if we take that product so first if you take that logarithm then it comes into that addition form and if you take anti logarithm then you will get that product so this product also you can get it through direct classical methods so direct multiplication by direct multiplication by direct multiplication you can also have this product so basically there are two methods one is just by direct multiplication you can have it or you just transform it so how are you doing this one so basically you are you have taken just logarithm and it comes into that additional form addition form and then if you take anti logarithm again you will get back this product so the same thing we do in case of laplace transform so laplace transform is a transform so here what we do say suppose we have that integral differential equation so let us see what happens in case of laplace transform so suppose you have that you have that uh, integral differential differential integral differential equation means an equation that may contain some derivative and integration like in case of say rlc circuit you can see that uh, whenever you will be writing that equation that kvl so it would be v equal to ir plus l di by dt plus 1 by c integration i dt so that means it consists of derivative and integral so that is called that integral differential equation so now if you take that laplace transform if you take that laplace transform that means you are transforming here 
So automatically, you know that the, the initial condition the initial condition is included by this Laplace transform. That is actually the one of the <clears throat> advantages of uh, solving that differential equation using Laplace transform. You need not to solve it um, separately that homogeneous equation and particular integral. And then after transform, what we do? Just if you do that algebraic manipulation, we get that uh, that reversed transform. So this reversed transform you get just by algebraic manipulation. Just algebraic manipulation. So now, how how do we get that solution? So solution is obtained just by taking the inverse Laplace transform. So this is very similar to the above one in case of logarithm, what we do. So two numbers are there, we take logarithm here and here you can see we take that Laplace transform and finally what happens in case of logarithmic uh, transform, you, you see we get the two numbers, product of these two numbers in addition form and here whenever you take that Laplace transform, it comes into that algebraic form and then do some algebraic manipulation, you will get it in revised transform form, transform. And then if you take inverse Laplace transform, very similar to that anti-logarithm, you will get that solution. So another way of getting this solution is that classical method. You apply the classical method. That means apply the classical method. Apply the classical method and you will get that solution. So this is actually that concept of doing that Laplace transform. And here there is one very important concept. So in this particular case, whenever we do the Laplace transform, so this side is actually done in time domain. And after the Laplace transform, when it comes into that algebraic form, alge alge algebraic form, so it becomes frequency domain. So in this course, we will be discussing in detail what is that uh, time domain and that frequency domain. So for the time being, you just take this information that this Laplace transform is very similar to that uh, uh, logarithmic that transform. And here you can see that if you have that uh, integral differential equation, then just by taking Laplace transform and transforming it in algebraic form, we can have that solution via this inverse Laplace transform. And the other method is that classical method. So let us see, that means if we do that Laplace transform, what are the uh, advantages we can have? And I hope you all know those things, just I am telling to just to recap uh, the theories that you have studied in your signets. So let us uh, see what is that Laplace transform given, given a real function, given a real function, uh, say ft, that satisfies, that satisfies this condition. I hope you all know that whether this function is uh, Laplace transformable or not. So then uh, this is that uh, and and uh, for uh, for some uh, for some finite uh, for 
for some finite real sigma for some finite real sigma so then then uh, fs equal to dt so this is actually uh, this is actually represented at this this is that laplace transform so then Here, this S is here, that S is called that Laplace variable. S is called that Laplace variable. And you all know that one-sided Laplace transform and both-sided Laplace transform. So one-sided Laplace transform, it makes sense since the systems are uh, causal. And that integration limit here, you can see that integration limit we have taken, that is that zero. So basically this is zero minus. The reason is we take zero minus to handle the jump discontinuity at origin. So that means this one-sided, Laplace transform. So in control, we will be taking one sided Laplace transform and it makes. It makes sense since the systems are uh, causal. Since the systems. Are causal. I think you all know that what is causal systems. It depends on that uh, present and the past. It does not depend on future. And the integration. Integration. So integration means say this one, this, this, this integration. This integration limit. limit is zero minus to infinity in order to in order to handle the jump discontinuity in order to handle in order to handle the jump discontinuity at jump discontinuity at origin. So you all know those things. So I am just writing the, the reason uh, those things should be required when we analyze that control systems. And uh, there are some uh, interesting features of that Laplace transforms that we have discussed here. So those things are, this is actually a mathematical tool uh, mathematical mathematical tool used to solve differential equation mathematical tool used to solve differential equation And this is actually that linear ordinary equation. And the homogeneous the homogeneous equation and the particular integral of the solution are obtained in one operation, as you all know. The homogeneous equation and the particular, the particular integral, the particular integral of the solution, of the solution, uh, are obtained in one operation. are obtained in one operation.
and it converts into algebraic form that we have discussed. It converts. So then it it is very helpful. That means whenever that uh, integral differential equation is converted into algebraic form, then it is very easy to handle. And I have already pointed out that means that initial conditions are automatically included via this, that, that transformation. So these are all important features of that Laplace transform. So here, let us see what we have discussed today. That is the Laplace transform. It is a transform and we have seen uh, how it is similar to that logarithmic transform. And one important thing is here in uh, case of Laplace transform, you know, before it, it is the time domain. And after that, it is frequency domain that we'll be discussing later. And here we have pointed out some features of that Laplace transform. And this is actually the condition uh, for which uh, the functions for which this condition is satisfied. Then that function is Laplace transformable. And uh, practically most of the practically almost all uh, physical signals are Laplace transformable. We can take some functions which are not Laplace transformable, like uh, say f t equal to e to the power a t to the power n. So that is not Laplace transformable, but uh, physically, practically, that type of signal does not exist. So mathematically, we can say that we can have many functions which are not Laplace transformable, but uh, practically, almost all functions are Laplace transformable. We have taken here uh, a one-sided uh, integration, one-sided Laplace transform, and we have taken that zero minus to handle the jump discontinuity, to handle jump discontinuity at origin. And uh, we have seen that uh, this uh, one-sided integral also makes sense as the systems are uh, causal, physical systems that we'll be considering, they are causal. And here uh, we have pointed out one important thing that means if you would like to solve these equations, integral differential equations, linear ordinary equations by, by Laplace transform, then uh, that particular integral and homogeneous uh, equations, so those two solutions are uh, obtained through one step. And another thing is by Laplace transform, we convert it into the algebraic form. Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh